Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Iowa's Creative Places webinar series. Uh, today, we're covering toolkits and examples of temporary creative placemaking experiences featuring the Iowa State University Extension and several community spotlights. My name is John Berg. I am Program Manager for Arts and Community Development, as well as Infrastructure for the Iowa Arts Council. Um, we are pleased to offer the Iowa Creative Places uh, webinar series to uh, not only support creative placemaking and placekeeping efforts through grants, place-based designations, webinars and events, technical assistance, and videos and storytelling. We offer a network of offerings, workshops, and programming centered around arts, culture, heritage, and historic preservation, and a platform to share stories of the people and places across Iowa who are leading successful creative placemaking, placekeeping work, as well as tools, resources, and connections to help communities create, preserve, and sustain their own authentic sense of place. Today, we are joined by Jennifer Drinkwater with the Iowa State University Extension Outreach and Outreach uh, CED program. Jennifer is also a member, member, faculty member of the Iowa State University, and we're thrilled to have her talk about some of her tools and uh, uh, services that are offered by CED, as well as some community examples who have utilized those toolkits and have put those uh, types of projects into action locally. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Jennifer, and uh, Jennifer, take it away. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. So like John said, I'm going to give a very brief um, overview of the Community and Economic Development Unit here at Iowa State Extension and Outreach. And then I'm going to segue into some best practices for putting two community art toolkits that I've written to work. So next slide, John. Our unit is made up of faculty members and Iowa State College of Design and community de development specialists on campus and around the state. We focus on quality of life, improving relationships, and making communities more equitable and resilient. We offer a wide range of programming with relationships at the core of each one. We know that when our networks are stronger, our Iowa communities are stronger. Next slide. Communities are the places where we live, work, and play. They're complex systems influenced by demographics, housing characteristics, leadership, drivers of the local economy, and the built environment. CED plays an important role in providing research-based information and resources to sustain Iowa communities into the future. So we work with communities. We align all of our efforts with the goals of maximizing diversity and inclusivity. So what you're seeing on the map are kind of how we break down Iowa into different regions and all of the specialists who cover each region. Next slide. CED uses our expertise to address critical issues through a variety of different ways. We have programs that build capacity. We have products and the toolkits are two examples of these products. We engage different processes and we do one-off projects to around the state. Next slide. So we're organized in five different area topic teams and this is what our, our um, specialists work towards. So we have a data and technology team. We have a civic engagement and equity team. We have a team that focuses on local governments and housing, particularly rural housing. We have a team that deals with food systems and local foods, and then we have a community and business development team. Next slide. So going into all the details of all the things that we offer through CED is kind of beyond the breadth of our webinar today. But if you're curious about what we can, how we can support your community, I'd invite you to check out this website link. Um, it's a really great unit and it's full of people from around Iowa who come together and really work toward the betterment of the whole state. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my area of expertise. I'm the community art specialist for the state of Iowa and I focus on community arts engagement. So what does that mean? Uh, there are many ways that art and placemaking can impact a community through economic development and beautification, just to name a few. The lens that I look through focuses on how we use art to engage folks in our communities and how we can use art to strengthen our community relationships. 
Since I started this role in 2015, I jumped into leading several large and pretty weird community art projects, including a large scale yarn bomb here in Ames. That's what you're seeing on the screen, that photo, a steamroll printmaking project, a community photography project. I've co-hosted Mayday festivals, you name it, I've been involved with it. So I decided to transform kind of the good, bad, and the ugly of these experiences into free downloadable toolkits so that others could learn from all my mistakes. They say you can either be a good role model or a horrible warning, and these toolkits come from both of those places. So before we look at the yarn bomb and pop-up toolkits specifically, I want to hit on some ways to approach using these toolkits. Next slide. First, where do you find them? So the link that you're seeing is will get you to the Iowa State Extension Store. And at this, at the Iowa State Extension Store is full of digital resources and digital products. Many of them are free. Some have a small fee involved. You can get to the toolkits in a couple of different ways. First, you can use the search bar at the top and pop in pop-up toolkit or yarn bomb toolkit. Or you can go over to the economic development tab and scroll down to community development and they should pop up there. If you look at the description above the payment, you'll see a short summary and those links will get you to the other toolkit. So there's four total. They're all free. They're all PDF downloads. If you click the download link, they um, will download immediately. You don't have to enter in your email address or anything like that. And they're all around 30 to 40 pages each, which don't be overwhelmed by that. I really wanted to provide as much support and resources to whatever scale project that you wanted to engage with. Um, so it might be a little bit overblown. But each toolkit is structured in the same way. So I introduce and, de and define the topic first, like what is a yarn bomb? What is a toolkit? Go over the benefits of what creating one can do for your community and then walk you through step by step from prompting you to think about the process not just the final outcome. We move through tips for building a team, to finding community partners, to understanding your audience. We then move into figuring out what success looks like for your community in particular, how to figure out a budget, how to write up a production plan, what is a simple marketing strategy, and how to celebrate your wins. Next slide. So once you've downloaded your toolkits, before you jump in with both feet, here are some best practices. I would highly encourage you to set aside a little time, because again, they're 30 to 40 pages each, and just read through the whole thing first. Um, you may encounter new ideas that you hadn't thought about toward the end. I tried to include as many Iowa community examples throughout each toolkit as possible. So you may get some crazy wild ideas from other communities. As you read through, jot down any notes or ideas as they come about. If you print them out, you can write them in the margins. You can open a note on your phone, whatever works for you. And then you want to set aside a little bit of time and you really want to think about your why. All right. So why do you want to create a temporary community art pro project in your community? Next slide. Here's why your why is so important. Many times we begin these projects with a flash of an idea. Either we've traveled somewhere else and seen something amazing in some other town, or we've seen something online, or we've heard about something from our friends. And we want to bring that beautiful, cool, weird, meaningful thing to our town. And that is an amazing reason. But the something beautiful can also lend itself to strengthening our communities in many, many ways that we don't even consider. So here's why that matters so much. For the last 30 years, Iowa State has conducted something called the Iowa Small Town Poll. Every 10 years, rural sociologists will send out a survey to 99 counties, one in every, uh, or 99 communities, one in every county of the state, to gauge people's perceptions of quality of life in their town. And here's what we know for the last 30 years of research. Communities with the highest self-reported levels of quality of life also have the highest levels of local civic engagement and the highest levels of social capital, which is just a fancy word of saying the strength of your community networks and a sense of belonging. And people self-report that those two things, local civic engagement and belonging are more important than income level and industry. So if you're on the webinar and you say, well, 
I live in a town that's not small. Like I live in a bigger community that may not resonate with, with my community. Um, I would argue that having participation, high local participation and high belonging will scale at any level so that you could think a little bit smaller in terms of like how it impacts your neighborhood or even at an organizational level. But those two elements, local civic engagement and belonging are beneficial no matter what. So community art projects that you can create using these toolkits can be super effective ways to engage people in your community and to add to that sense of belonging, but only if you're deliberate about it from the outset. So I, I really had this in mind when I structured the toolkits is to get you to think about building relationships through the process. Next slide. So if we're gonna use these projects to engage people, then fun is a crucial ingredient. Because if you, as the initiator, the ringleader, the project overseer are stressed, if you're overly serious, and if you're miserable during the process, you can bet that folks that you engage with will also be stressed, overly serious and miserable. We know from research that attitudes are contagious. So this is really important. A lot of times, again, we get so hit, we so get tunnel vision for the final outcome of the project that we sort of lose sight of how to structure the process. Next slide. So be honest about what you can feasibly do. So this may impact the scale of your project or the timing of your project, or it may dictate how many other people you invite and give creative liberty to. It's always, always better to do a small, well-orchestrated something than a large, messy disaster. Take it from me. Next slide. Because community art assumes many humans are involved, right? You're gonna be working with more people. And if you have a committee or a team, you are a de facto project leader or manager. So you set the tone of the entire project and um, just take that seriously. All right, next slide. Let's look at the two toolkits. We're gonna to start with the Yarn Bomb toolkit. I wanna to mention that what um, I go over for the Yarn Bomb will likely apply to the pop-up toolkit. So just keep everything in mind. If you're scratching your head right now and you're wondering what is a yarn bomb, you're not alone. It is a temporary installation using knitted or crocheted forms to cover a community structure or a tree or bicycles. Yarn bombs can be really fun and can engage a broad range of folks. They are more playful, they're less permanent than something like a big sculpture or a mural. And so they require kind of less community um, permissions to get them done. They can engage people from, you know, school age children to people in retirement communities. So many people where we live knit and crochet and they don't necessarily consider themselves to be artists. So this is a really great opportunity to expand your creative network in your community. Um, and it's an easy way for people to get involved, right? They can knit, they can crochet, they can donate yarn, clean out closets and get rid of stuff. Um, it's just a, it's a kind of has a, a lot of entry points into this. So if this is a project you're interested in, we're going to hear from Lauren Colliff, who's the director of the Avenues of Ingersoll and Grand in Des Moines about her experiences leading a yarn bomb this summer. Um, but there are a few things I want to encourage you to figure out before you jump in with both feet. Next slide. First, and figure out how much engagement and outreach you would like and can handle. So yarn bombs can get big fast because so many people knit and crochet in our communities. So by engagement, I mean, who, what's happening on the back end? How many people do you need to make what you envision? How many knitters do you need to participate? And what skill level do they have? Do you want to use this project as a way to introduce beginning pe beginners to knitting? It could be an educational tool um, for schools or a service learning project. And by outreach, I mean, what's the afterlife of your project? Do you want to donate your products after the installation yarn bomb comes down? You could transform them into scarves, blankets, hats. The yarn bomb that I organized in Ames covered a two-story building on Main Street. Um, and after the three-week installation, we took it down, we had it dry cleaned, and we transformed it into 45 blankets. 
And I had a number of people come up to me and say that that was the reason that they got involved and to begin with, because they wanted to make sure that what they were making was going to a good cause. So really consider if that's an element of the project that you want to engage with, the outreach part. And if it is, I would really think about communicating that from the outset and really spreading the word because it can be a great recruitment tool and a great partnership opportunity for people. Next slide. So both the engagement, the makers, and the outreach, the afterlife, can really influence the site and the scale of the project, right? You really want to think about where is this going to take place, indoors or outdoors, on a structure, on a in a natural environment, and how big is it going to be? The timing can be really important, too, as we'll hear about in the Nitical Mass project, um, so you may be creating something in conjunction for a larger event or during a seasonal part of the year. So you really want to think about that before you get started. Next slide. Ask for help. This is a this is a um, this is a good like be a horrible warning example for me. When I started the Yarn Bomb Project in Ames. I didn't know how to knit or crochet. In fact, I still don't know how to knit or crochet. And so for better or worse, and it ended up being for better, it forced me to um, really lean on people. I hired a good friend as a, to be a fiber consultant for the project. She taught a couple of art uh, free knitting classes to community members. She helped to oversee our biweekly knitting circle. She helped me figure out what yarn I needed to buy. Um, if I had been in charge of the whole thing, I would have gotten like way more gray hairs. So the community art projects really lend themselves to giving you the chance to relinquish aesthetic control and to provide opportunities for some informal leadership development in your community. So you can engage with people who may not be on city council, who may not be um, like on a main street board, but who have, have some great creative expertise that's maybe kind of unknown and they have some wild ideas and they can really step into their own in these sorts of projects. So um, the important thing to remember when you ask for help, and again, is to relinquish control. Don't focus so much on the product outcome, focus more about that investment in relationships. So trust the people that you hire or the people that you ask to volunteer, give them um, room to lead, give them room to, to kind of use their vision and shape the project and learn how to step back. Remember, fun is crucial. And so it's actually way more important for you to have a really fun experience, even if the end of the project is like a total disaster. I mean, as long as it doesn't like hurt anybody, the um, the relationships that you develop through this process is that's the gold mine. That is really kind of the community glue um, versus that final project. Next slide. And document your creation process, right? You want to think about this before you get started. Yarn bomb projects really lend themselves to fun media, right? You lots of colorful. Um, playful, hilarious, fun photos. You could use video. Um, think about where this is going to live online. If you want Facebook, if you want to use TikTok, if you want to use Instagram, if you want to have a YouTube presence or just a simple website, but think about really sharing your wins frequently and early. That's what I've learned through community projects is to maintain momentum and get people really excited is it's important to share out frequently. If you're not a tech person and you have zero interest in social media, you can do this in kind of like an analog way. So one of the things that we did for our Intertwine Yarn Bomb project was we had, like I mentioned, the bi-weekly knitting circles. And so those took place at an art gallery on Main Street in Ames. And a few months in, we decided to take them on the road. So we started showing up at the local brewery and the pub and the wine bar. And there was a, definitely a theme around alcohol. Um, but it was great because it got people exposed to the project who weren't involved directly. People would come up, ask what we were doing. And so then we could share with them about the project. So they were excited about seeing it. And when it was finally installed, we had kind of made some really good inroads in our community. So people were stoked to see it. So just think about how you're gonna get the word out and commit to doing that on a regular basis. Um, plus it, it was a great way of supporting local businesses in the process too, to go to all those places. 
All right, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk briefly about the pop-up toolkit. Next slide. This is the newest one. It was released a few months ago and it was inspired by COVID. Um, pivot was the word of 2020, right? Everything went outside, went um, temporary. And so I wanted to create something that supported all of these efforts. And pop-up is really broad. And so the way that I decided to define it for myself for this resource was it's public, it's temporary, and it's unexpected. And if that's too broad for you, I created a list of some examples. So next slide. This is a page directly from the toolkit. Um, chances are looking through these, you've probably been to one even in the last month, just where you live. So one day exhibitions, art or music festivals, a yarn bomb is technically could be a pop-up. Um, parklets, theater or music productions, pop-up clubs, um, pop-up restaurants, food trucks, music walks, storytelling events, the sky is the limit. Next slide. So a few best practices before you jump into getting your pop-up off the ground. Uh, again, I would say do a, a like a thorough read through. This is a little bit longer of a toolkit. There are cool Iowa examples peppered throughout the toolkit. This is a the photo you're looking at now is from Jewel, Iowa. And um but I would say that pop-ups, a good thing to keep in mind, pop-ups don't exist in a vacuum. So this, their success and effectiveness really depends on the attention to your local context. And that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, where is this thing going to take place? Who lives and works nearby? Um, or it could mean timing. Are you piggybacking your pop-up on top of an event with something else that's happening? You really basically just want to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on where you live, the issues, the events, the people who could be impacted. And this could affect the time of year that this takes place or the place that it happens or the folks that you want to engage with. And here's another way of thinking about this kind of in the public art sphere. So in the public art world, you sometimes will hear the phrase plop art. And that just refers to when an artist, typically a sculptor, displays a large public piece in a community and it has no real reference to the community at all. Like the person's not local, um, they, you know, a committee sort of bought or borrowed a piece and just plopped it down. This can sometimes be super successful. People can really resonate in a positive way to the art. And sometimes it falls flat because people don't see themselves or their experiences reflected in the art at all. So they don't have an attachment to it. So I would just encourage you to have your pop-up not be a plop art version of placemaking. You want to make sure that you are reflecting the places and the people that you live near in your experience that you create. Next slide. So if you are starting something totally new this year, if you got a wild idea and you're like, I've got to get this done in the next year, I'm going to go crazy. I would highly recommend to focus your efforts. Do less with more. That is a phrase that I heard during a creative capital workshop hosted by the Iowa Arts Council a few years ago, and I just loved it. It basically means focus on doing one to two things really, really well and maximize your resources for that. As creative people, we tend to have so many more ideas than we have bandwidth for, much less money, time, you know, materials for. And sometimes that doesn't work out too well. So if we can get into a habit of really kind of focusing our effort and maximizing an experience to the fullest, it's gonna be way more effective. Um, you know, you want to see how things go the first time, especially, and then you can always repeat, adjust, or scale up if things get, get, you know, if it's something you want to keep doing year after year. Next slide. So if you've done a pop-up, you've participated in a pop-up event, and you want to refine it, tweak it, make it better, if you got a new couple of ideas, I would invite you to really focus on using that experience to strengthen relationships in your community. Um, and that could mean a couple of different things. It could be, um, it may look like making the whole process way more fun for the people involved, you know, maybe spreading out the timeline more, not having like 
stereotypical meetings, but meeting someplace fun. It could be inviting new people to have leadership roles in the process. It could be engaging new partners or having a new location. It could be um, being deliberate about maybe targeting your pop-up experience to have an impact on a local goal or a civic issue. So the sky is the limit for that, but I would just really encourage you again to leverage these projects in a way that creates belonging and that creates uh, local opportunities for engagement. Next slide. Finally, remember that you set the tone, right? As someone who is initiating a community project, these are can be such a gift to your community. They can be sources of joy, can really instill pride in people of where they live, but you just set the tone of the project. Make sure that if you're happy, they will be happy. So my final slide, next slide is here's my contact information. Remember that I am your community art specialist for the state of Iowa. So if you are, have got brainstorm help or need some support, you can always reach out to me. I'm here for you. And these two images that you see here, these are, these are pages from the pop-up toolkit. Because they're so long, I started creating an actual little checklist of, of things to remember um, and best practices. So it's just an example of what you can find when you download them and um, a great way, again, of learning from my mistakes. So now we're going to switch gears and you get to hear some wonderful examples from, um, from two communities in Iowa. So I'm going to introduce Lauren Colliff, who is the director of the Avenues of Ingersoll and Grand. And she helped to lead Nidical Mass, which was a yarn bomb project during RAGBRAI this year. So take it away, Lauren. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, yes, I am Lauren Koloff. I am with the Avenues of Ingersoll and Grand. If you're not familiar, we are a district in Des Moines, Iowa. We are just west of um, the downtown area, um, the area between Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway and 42nd Street, the avenues of Ingersoll and Grand, obviously. Um, and we help provide enhanced marketing, enhanced maintenance, um, some fun public art and events in this district. And we are also a cultural and entertainment district um, from the state of Iowa. So yeah, today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Nidical Mass, which was our own version of a yarn bomb um, right here on Ingersoll Avenue. Next slide. Okay, so how it started. Uh, as you can see on the left, um, my very talented uh, committee member, Brianne Sanchez, I think she's on this call. She's in the back right there in that picture. Um, I'm in the front. Anyway, so she had had this vision to do a yarn bomb for a long time on Ingersoll. And originally we thought maybe we would do it on a fence. Um, but during Art Week in Des Moines, which happened in June, we decided to get together for a little brainstorm session at a local coffee shop um, here on Ingersoll Avenue to think about what a yarn bomb could look like on Ingersoll Avenue. And eventually our idea evolved into instead of doing something on a fence, um, maybe we could do something on bikes. We thought it would just be um, a little easier and it would fit our neighborhood. And it also aligned with an upcoming event, RAGBRAI, which, as you all know, rolls through Iowa every July. So after this little brainstorm session, uh, we put it out on our social media and our website immediately um, asking for help from our community. Um, we were asking them to donate yarn and or knit or crochet the rectangles. Um, and we wanted them to drop them off at this coffee shop, Chain and Spoke, um, which is a very popular new coffee shop. Like I said, it's bike themed. So it, it all fit together. Um, and another really important person in this picture here is a person in the front right, um, Jen Geigley. She's actually a local fiber artist here in Des Moines, um, and Brianne was aware of her and her work and invited her to be a part of this process, which really proved to be crucial in the success. Um, next slide. Okay, so... Yeah, we had our brainstorming meeting in June. We knew that we had a deadline of July. <laughs> so here's how it went. Um, I also, like Jennifer said, she didn't know how to knit or crochet. I don't know how to knit or crochet. I know nothing about it. Um, but turns out there are a lot of people in Des Moines that do. I was overwhelmed with how many people dropped off 
donations of yarn, like so many donations that we had to tell people to stop donating yarn and to please start crocheting squares. So you can see in that picture there on the left, um, it's full of yarn, it's full of crocheted squares. Um, and so we were just really overwhelmed by how many donations we were able to get. Um, and then the hard part started. <laughs> you actually had to wrap these bikes. So in the middle there, you can see Brienne again. She used all of the donated yarn and the squares to wrap two bicycles using the community donations. And then on the right, you see Jen, the fiber artist. Um, no hate on Brienne. She did an awesome job, but I think you can see the difference when you have like when you engage with a professional artist to help you with these sorts of projects. Like, look how beautiful Jen's bikes are. And they were actually still functional. Um, so she used some of the yard donations, but she also, I think, bought some yarn because she was wanting to complete a certain color scheme with her with her bicycles. Uh, so yeah, that is how it went. We ended up with five total bicycles. Also note that all of the bicycles were donated um, by the Street Collective, which is another nonprofit organization here in Des Moines. Um, they have a bike shop that's part of their, their mission. And so they donated some defunct bicycles uh, to our project. Next slide. Okay. So yes, five total yarn bomb bicycles, three created by Jen, and then two created by Brienne. And then we also still had some extra pieces left over, which we um, put onto the bike um, racks. So the two um, bikes that Brienne made, we ended up leaving those at Chain and Spoke. They have a bike rack there. We thought it would be fun for people to see, hey, if you donated yarn, like this is what we did with it. And then we placed... Um, Jen's three bikes, one at each of these bike corrals. The bike corrals are also a project um, in conjunction with the street collective. Every year they place three bike corrals on the street. Um, they take over one parking spot each in front of some popular um, restaurants and coffee shops here on our street to sort of give people the option to bike during the warmer weather months. And so we put one bike on each of those corrals. So it was kind of fun that the, the bikes were sprinkled up and down Ingersoll. Next slide. Okay, so uh, Jennifer also mentioned that yarn bombs make for like really fun media, and that is so true. So uh, I'm going to have John play these. Unfortunately, you can't hear the music, um, otherwise they'd be even cooler. But you can kind of see here, Jen had so much fun. She uh, made several TikToks and several um, videos for her YouTube page. Um, about the process of creating the yarn bomb bicycles. She had a ton of fun with this. She had previously done a smaller yarn bomb project. Um, and then here's a video we made of install day, as you can see us uh, running across the street with the bicycles and putting them on the on the bike corrals. Yeah, you. it's like, it's impossible not to take fun pictures and videos of these bicycles. And they got really great engagement um, on our social media platforms. Like, as you can see, we got like 282 likes on, on our post. Jen had 700 on that post and she made several. So it was also just a really fun thing to have on our, our social media that week, especially as there was a lot of excitement um, in Des Moines leading up to RAGBRAI. So everybody was just eating up all the bike content in general. Next slide. All right. So some of the keys to success, Jen in her, um, or Jennifer in her presentation talked a lot about relationships and that's so true. Um, we already had a partnership with the Des Moines Street Collective. So it was really easy to just, you know, text them and be like, Hey, do you have any bikes, um, that we can, we can have, uh, so partnership with other like-minded organizations was made one piece of this project really easy, especially with our tight turnaround time. Um, engaging a local artist to lead the project, I think this was like so, so, so critical. Jen, she had done a yarn bombing project before. She's very connected to the, the local knitting community so that when she puts a call out for yarn, it's it's meeting the right people. Um, and then she could offer guidance Um to Brianne and to us about what are we even asking for people to donate? How long is this going to take? Um, another key to success for us was we had a really supportive business owner, Chain and Spoke, and it was awesome that, you know, their shop mission aligns with our project really well, bicycling. 
Um, we had a tie to an event, which was RAGBRAI. We actually thought originally that it would be a fun way to get RAGBRAI riders up to our street. Turns out, as you all know, it was like 100 degrees the week of RAGBRAI. So I do not know how many RAGBRAI riders actually came up to Ingersoll to see these, but I saw a lot of local people stopping, taking pictures with the bikes, you know, ooing and eyeing over them as, as I was um, out on the street as well. Um, so originally it was for RAGBRAI, but I think the locals had a lot more fun with it than the RAGBRAI riders. And then alignment with the goals of our district. So if you're not familiar, Ingersoll, the avenues, we've made huge, huge, huge investments in um, bike and mobility infrastructure on our corridor with um, raised and protected bike lanes, bike racks. Um, we're trying to be a very connected neighborhood. Um, a bike friendly neighborhood. So this project, it was art, it was fun, but it also aligned with the goals of our district and helped us help to continue to promote the avenues as a bike friendly corridor. So it was really the perfect, the perfect project for us. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much for inviting me to present. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, now we'll head over to Oskaloosa uh, with the team of Brant Bullman from William Penn University and Allison and Andy McGuire with the George Daly Auditorium. So go ahead and take it away on that project spotlight. All right. Well, I'm Brant Bullman. I'm the director of theater um, at William Penn University, and I'm a puppeteer. Here's a picture of uh, Andy McGuire from the George Daly and myself uh, performing at the West Liberty Children's Festival in the size of puppets I uh, prefer to make. And uh, last uh, fall, I was transitioning to a new position uh, at William Penn, and uh, my master's is in community arts with an emphasis on puppetry. So I thought, what better way to unify these different uh, kind of separate uh, units on William Penn campus, the uh, creative arts and the theater and the new media film studies, but to uh, make a giant uh, project that would uh, uh, could be a spectacle and really do be something different. So you can go to the next slide. So uh, I'm familiar with in the puppet community, Andrew Kim from Thingamajig Puppet Theater in England, who's uh, the, the big name right now in, in uh, parade puppetry. And uh, through some internet groups, uh, I approached him about if he would be interested in coming and leading a two-week workshop and what would it take and what resources he would need. And so over the course of a couple months or six months or so, uh, we worked on some proposals and some uh, got funding and uh, secured uh, Andrew Kim to come to campus. Next slide. So uh, we were very interested in his lantern puppetry, which he's very famous for. Uh, he uh, is a uh, has is from Korea originally and adopted kind of the uh, some of the Korean tradition of making lanterns with the giant parade puppets that he had worked on here in America to in invent a technique of making these giant. Uh, lantern puppets that he's made all over the world. So I really love the idea of uh, someone who maybe was making puppets in Mardi Gras and at Stonehenge and like all these places around the world. He was at Chicago at the big uh, World Puppet Festival. And then for two weeks, he was in Oskaloosa uh, making puppets. Next slide. And the one of the big whys is because uh, in December, first Saturday in December, we have the Oskaloosa Lighted Christmas Parade, which uh, I believe is the greatest uh, cultural event of the holidays in the state of Iowa and ranks up there in the Midwest. We have uh, 10,000 or more people come and pack our little town and uh, 60 to 70 big lighted floats and stuff. But what we really needed were 12 foot tall dancing puppets at our lighted Christmas parade. So while uh, the two weeks of working and learning from Andrew Kim were important and the festival that we would have around it, a bigger goal was we're going to make something to uh, that'll go into the lighted Christmas parade and also help create a tradition of large lighted puppets uh, for the future. Next slide. 
So uh, we created a workshop in the middle of our uh, Musco Technology Center, which is where our uh, new media uh, film studies is located, but it's also has a huge open atrium that's a nice workspace. And for two weeks, we uh, I, students and local artists and the faculty worked to create two large puppets. We secured a grant through the Iowa Arts Council, and we had a community partner who helped float some money. And like I say, the uh, pin provided the, the workspace. Next slide. Uh, the nice thing about this was here you had the one of the premier puppeteers in the world working shoulder to shoulder with you know, 20 year old uh, students. And they designed from sketches all the way to a finished project, two giant lantern puppets. One, a woman we call the muse of Oskaloosa because Oskaloosa is uh, small but mighty in its um, cultural footprint. Even though we're only, you know, 11 to 12,000 people, we have so much going on in the arts. Uh, next slide. Uh, we uh, invited a lot of students in. Uh, one of my favorite moments were uh, one of the new media professors would bring in her English students. And there were uh, students that normally would, haven't ever done anything like this who got to engage in making these giant hands. And when they showed up at the celebration, they had so much ownership and pride. And if I would have just kept it to the like, eight or 10 creative arts students, we wouldn't have, I don't think had the same synergy on campus. Next slide. Uh, we also made a giant mammoth. Uh, we uh, have, we're mammothly creative and oh, there's a mammoth skeleton found here that's at our environmental learning center. So we decided to make a life-sized mammoth, which uh, was quite the challenge. There's Andrew and, my, and some of my team putting the the mammoth together and over there on the right is our muse and the team that was getting ready to use uh, to, to figure out how it was going to work because uh, we did at the last day a uh, lantern parade through our rec trail system and through the middle of campus and then kind of a this was in September but we kind of did a May day kind of a dance at the end. Next slide. Uh, there is the mammoth uh, in action going down the trail. It uh, was took six people to operate it, including one person in the belly of the beast. Next slide. Uh, we wanted to engage the community, so we also made, we actually had high school students come in and make some, uh, these kind of uh, pyramid-shaped lantern puppets. And uh, and then we also, we, we tried to really like engage our uh, arts and culture partners. So we had uh, Andy McGuire, who's this uh, uh, great children's theater type person, hand out these lanterns to kids and he led them down the trail. They had no idea what to expect, but they walked down the trail with their lanterns to find us kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And then Allison McGuire, she is uh, an opera singer. We did this real kind of almost religious experience where she walked out of a tunnel with a lantern singing uh, opera and it echoed out of the, the this rec trail tunnel and then she came out and lit the muse who danced around and lit the mammoth and just really and we had a drum line it turned into this this really primordial religious experience almost next slide there's Andy leading the people, and uh, he did a great job of engaging them. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Andy. Huh. Um, so I'm the executive director of the auditorium. I My partnership with this project was mostly uh, support. Uh, as an, uh, Most of what I can speak to probably comes from more of a theater and a community administrator for things. Uh, but my my like training is in theater. I, I did a lot of outdoor Shakespeare uh, throughout college and and teaching that. So I have a little bit of carnival barker in me. So so it was a really great opportunity to to try and work at trying to draw a crowd in and get them interested in the mystery around it. I would say I would echo a lot of what 
what Brandt uh, and and this whole thing was was a very ritualistic, very holy theater experience uh, on top of the visual and and sculpting aspects of it. Uh, puppetry is is an excellent uh, magical piece of theater that that really transcends just any one art medium. And and I think doing it at night in a town that has a lot of background with lights, uh, a pretty special experience. And on uh, the next slide, you see this, the, the beginning moment. And here's Allison. And I love how there were many different arts involved in this. We had singing, we had, there was dancing involved. I gave a, a bit of a uh, a, 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 a sermon at the end about being creative and fighting hatred and 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 negativity through the arts. Next slide. Here's the lighting of the lady, and then she went over and engaged the uh, the mammoth, which is our next slide, and then the drum corps. Uh, kicked up and the drum corps were, were actually from the local high school and that uh, again the more partners we engage the more buy-in you had okay a couple more here let's go to an action shot of the two and they uh there there's something about large scale puppetry that is so engaging that uh it it, it 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 there's a shock and awe quality to it and you'll see that in the next slide there is, uh, Andrew was really good. He actually operated the lady here on this one. And uh, when he would go into the crowd, there would be oohs and ahs. Next slide. That's us going up a big hill and you can see me. I had to be like a, uh, <laughs> it was like, rowing a boat up the uh up, up this big hill and i had to you know onward onward it was really an experience i we it was almost like the trojan mammoth that we were rolling into the middle of campus next and if you push play and we'll see if this works this is andy engaging the crowd here they they were walking out uh, about a quarter of a mile to uh, to where the puppets were, and then we walked, danced with the drum all the way to the middle of the campus. I love the uh, that is one of my very best actresses who was the trunk and she got so into the movement and then we ended with this dance around the muse this we walked in a circle and then i did a, a little speech so let's to wrap this up next slide here i've got some takeaways all right you can go one more uh, th so there's a real ripple effect from this cultural project. We learned a lot of skills that the gal with the trunk there, uh, she's been making her own cosplay um, projects based off of the, the, the sculpting skills she learned. She's the type to do more work at home than for college projects. It brought the cultural community together and also engaged there was a lot of like coaches and sport people at this that don't come to our uh, plays usually. Um, it, it really uh, was good at, at bringing in all the different cultural groups from town to to work together. And um, I just really liked the idea of expanding what theater can be. I love street theater like at Jackson Hole with the melodrama shootouts uh, and at uh, I love the opportunity of taking the lighted Christmas parade and making it uh, a spectacle of, of theater. And um, I think it's also a great way to represent Oskaloosa. There's actually pictures of the muse and mammoth dancing on the uh, chamber uh, stickers that are on all the stores downtown. So every time I walk into a business, I like do a little strut because uh, our project is on there. So it's become a symbol of the community.
Thank you. Thank you, Brant, uh, Allison, and Andy. At this time, I know we've got a few minutes left. Just wanted to open it up for you know any Q and A or questions um, from the the participants today. You can use the Q and A uh, feature on the on your Zoom portal, or um, we can just go that direction. Just open it up to questions for our panelists, Jennifer, Lauren, Brant Bullman, and uh, Andy and Allison McGuire. John, I have a question for Allison and Andy. Go ahead. Um, I would love, Allison and Andy have been kind of at the forefront of a lot of really amazing events in their tenure at Oskaloosa. And I would love to hear their thoughts on what community art projects, like how that's impacted kind of the greater Oskaloosa community from their perspective. Not to put y'all on the spot, but you have a lot of great insight. I, I think that's a great, great question. I think for me, um, Allison, this is uh, maybe something I've seen the most in uh, ripple effect of the largest community events in Oskaloosa. We have some really big events besides the, the lightest Christmas parade, um, like Art on the Square in the summer. And I think for a while, I noticed when uh, we were first moving into the community, uh, it seemed a little bit like, um, you know, mostly just the groups that were organizing the event were involved and it didn't always ripple out into the rest of the community. And one thing I'm seeing as a result of all these different creative projects happening is that when I'm sitting in planning meetings for Art on the Square or other community events, all of a sudden it seems much more open to, can we invite this group and they can figure out how they wanna tie in. And then this other group could maybe amplify in this way. And I think people are more open to building their capacity and more willing to let other people play in their sandbox. Um, and I think that's been maybe just from witnessing the success of some of these events that are more inclusive. Yeah, I think uh, I would echo that uh, a lot. One of the things that's starting to become really interesting that we're, we are still learning how to really work out, but a few months ago, the, the city mayor had come to us and talked about how they wanted to have the arts community involved in what hopefully will be the artwork on a new water tower that's being developed. And, and I think for Allison and myself, at least, I won't, I won't speak for Brandt, but, but I think we, we we're we pretty frequent partners on things in a lot of ways, uh, but, but we have become very interested in, it's not just about like, what is, what is the art part doing is how are we contributing to the larger, the larger community picture. And so, so those things take something and we using a water tower as an example, something that you could just write the city name on, but how are we going to take that to the next level to have something that the community can be truly proud of and be excited for. And, and so we're starting to see more of the sort of practical uh, more of an effort to not just be as practical as possible, but to engage this more uh, aesthetically driven, artistically driven uh, viewpoints of things, because they all help build community and they all help build capacity. And so I hopefully as a community, we are learning how as a part of the puzzle, arts provide more than just any icing on the cake. They are just as valid to be part of the chemical ingredients of the cake. And, and I think with this particular project, one of the things that was awesome is I had a guy who turned to me while we were walking and he's like, I never dreamed anything like this would ever happen in our community. Cause it, it is kind of weird. It was a weird thing, but he went because his kids wanted to, he, he, but he ended up having a really wonderful experience. And, and some of that comes from with this project in particular that I am always trying to take away from is it's not just about doing like the art thing or getting the groups involved. I think it's a, also a matter of letting people who have these passions and talents unleash them 
on those passions and talents. Brand for a long time has been the puppet guy. And I think it was two or three years before we actually got to see the big puppets really start to make momentum. And so the ecosystem and freedom of creativity is just as important as the idea. Uh, and so remember to turn people loose on those things. Let them let them develop and put put their passion out there because it is more powerful than you think. Um, I this is John. I just wanted to build on that and and note that the the parade was kind of uh, an event where it was still kind of coming out of the pandemic um, and the idea of building those connections again. Um, the role that these events and and uh, types of things play in that. I do realize we're coming short on time, but I did want to pivot over to Lauren and kind of ask the same question. As you think about, Lauren, as you think about the redevelopment of the avenues of Ingersoll and Grand through major infrastructure improvements, and I know you've had a number of arts projects come to fruition over the last you know couple of years, um, how do you think that that plays a role in the fabric of the district itself? Well, I think public art is just something that really brings people together. <clears throat> like you said, John, we've had some huge infrastructure projects. Uh, many of those involve construction. And, you know, those construction projects are not always as popular. Or they get people frustrated. But public art is always something that people seem to rally around. Um, they love seeing the content on like our marketing channels about public art. Whenever we post anything about public art, everyone gets really excited. So I just think public art is just one way to bring people together. And that's why I love so much that this, um, the Yarn Bomb also incorporated bicycles because it was like, a great like public art yay everyone loves that but also it was promoting one of the goals and one of the you know investments of our district which was to be you know bike friendly um so yeah i just think public art is something that everyone seems to rally around and and people really enjoy and Thank gives you. people a reason uh to visit your district Wonderful. I had a question for Brant though. Can I ask Brant another question quickly? Yes. Oh, I was just wondering if the if the big puppets and everything were going to be back this year. You said they had kind of become like a a a symbol. Uh, are they are they coming back this this year? Yeah. The uh, our theme for the lighted Christmas parade this year is the heart of Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Heart. And uh, I so I am making a uh, heart a necklace to go around the muse and uh, that will light up um, and the mammoth yes very much will come back he uh, has been big woolly we call him we've re-engineered him so he's pulled behind a golf cart usually or we're powered by a couple of uh, people pulling it so it's easier to get around the streets but yes they they will come back I, it keeps me on my toes I have to re-solder uh, the joints of a few <laughs> spots and make sure they still work I got like goosebumps when you showed the picture of the of the puppets coming through the tunnel. They're amazing. Yeah, it was. It, it, sometimes you have a vision of what something's going to be like, and this was so much more magical than I ever dreamed could happen. It was a, a good thing. It. I was there. It was amazing. It's. It was one of the coolest events I've ever been to in my whole entire life. I was like teary there. It was. It was magic. Creating magic and connections. Uh, great to hear about these uh, two projects um, and all the collaboration that happens as part of that. Uh, thank you again to um, Andy, Allison, um, Lauren for sharing your projects. And thank you, Jennifer and the Extension Office for all you do and for sharing these wonderful toolkits. Uh, we'll be placing this recording um, for future viewing as well as links to the those toolkits to those that registered for today's webinar. Uh, and would like to thank you all for joining us today for Iowa's Creative Places. And uh, at this time, we'll, we'll wrap and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us today. Take care.